it originates with appropriations from Congress and is made complete by a feckless president. A conservative president must look to the legislative branch for decisive action. The administrative state is not going anywhere until Congress acts to retrieve its own power from bureaucrats and the White House. But in the meantime, there are many executive tools a courageous conservative president can use to handcuff the bureaucracy, push Congress to return to its constitutional responsibility, restore power over Washington to the American people, bring the administrative state to heel, and in the process defang and defund the woke culture warriors who have infiltrated every last institution in America. The conservative promise lays out how to use many of these tools including, how to fire supposedly unfireable federal bureaucrats, how to shutter wasteful and corrupt bureaus and offices, how to muzzle woke propaganda at every level of government, how to restore the American people's constitutional authority over the administrative state, and how to save untold taxpayer dollars in the process. Finally, the president can restore public confidence and accountability to our most important government function of all, national defense. The American people desire a military full of highly skilled servicemen and women who can protect the homeland and our interests overseas. The next conservative president must end the left's social experimentation with the military, restore war fighting as its sole mission, and set defeating the threat of the Chinese Communist Party as its highest priority. The next conservative president must possess the courage to relentlessly put the interests of the everyday American over the desires of the ruling elite. Their outrage cannot be prevented, it must simply be ignored. And it can be. The left derives its power from the institutions they control. But those institutions are only powerful to the extent that constitutional officers surrender their own legitimate authority to them. A president who refuses to do so and uses his or her office to reimpose constitutional authority over federal policymaking can begin to correct decades of corruption and remove thousands of bureaucrats from the positions of public trust they have so long abused. Promise number three, defend our nation's sovereignty, borders, and bounty against global threats. The United States belongs to we the people. All government authority derives from the consent of the people, and our nation's success derives from the character of its people. The American people's right to rule ourselves is the obverse of our duty, we cannot outsource to others our obligation to ensure the conditions that allow our families, local communities, churches, and synagogues, and neighborhoods to thrive. The buck stops with each of us, so each of us must have the freedom to pursue the good for ourselves and those entrusted to our care. To most Americans, this is common sense. But in Washington, D.C., and other centers of leftist power like the media and the academy, this statement of basic civics is branded hate speech. Progressive elites speak in lofty terms of openness, progress, expertise, cooperation, and globalization. But too often, these terms are just rhetorical Trojan horses concealing their true intention stripping we the people of our constitutional authority over our country's future. America's corporate and political elites do not believe in the ideals to which our nation is dedicated self-governance, the rule of law, and ordered liberty. They certainly do not trust the American people, and they disdain the Constitution's restrictions on their ambitions. Instead, they believe in a kind of 21st century Wilsonian order in which the enlightened, highly educated managerial elite runs things rather than the humble, patriotic working families who make up the majority of what the elites contemptuously call flyover country. This Wilsonian hubris has spread like a cancer through many of America's largest corporations, its public institutions, and its popular culture. Those who run our so-called American corporations have bent to the will of the woke agenda and care more for their foreign investors and organizations than their American workers and customers. Today, nearly every top-tier U.S. university president or Wall Street hedge fund manager has more in common with a socialist, European head of state than with the parents at a high school football game in Waco, Texas. Many elites' entire identity, it seems, is wrapped up in their sense of superiority over those people. But under our constitution, they are the mere equals of the workers who shower after work instead of before. This is as it should and must be. Intellectual sophistication, advanced degrees, financial success, and all other markers of elite status have no bearing on a person's knowledge of the one thing most necessary for governance, what it means to live well. That knowledge is available to each of us, no matter how humble our backgrounds or how unpretentious our attainments. It is open to us to read in the book of human nature, to which we are all offered the key just by merit of our shared humanity. One of the great premises of American political life is that everyone who can read in that book must have a voice in deciding the course and fate of our republic. Progressive policymakers and pundits in America either fail to understand this premise or intentionally reject it. They enthusiastically support supranational organizations like the United Nations and European Union, which are run and staffed almost entirely by people who share their values and are mostly insulated from the influence of national elections. That's why they are eager for America to sign international treaties on everything from pharmaceutical patents to climate change to the rights of the child and why those treaties invariably endorse policies that could never pass through the U.S. Congress. Like the progressive Woodrow Wilson a century ago, the woke left today seeks a world, bound by global treaties they write, in which they exercise dictatorial powers over all nations without being subject to democratic accountability. 
That's why today's progressive left so cavalierly supports open borders despite the lawless humanitarian crisis their policy created along America's southern border. They seek to purge the very concept of the nation-state from the American ethos, no matter how much crime increases or resources drop for schools and hospitals or wages decrease for the working class. Open borders activism is a classic example of what the German theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer called cheap grace publicly promoting one's own virtue without risking any personal inconvenience. Indeed, the only direct impact of open borders on pro-open borders elites is that the constant flow of illegal immigration suppresses the wages of their housekeepers, landscapers, and busboys. Cheap Grace aptly describes the left's love affair with environmental extremism. Those who suffer most from the policies environmentalism would have us enact are the aged, poor, and vulnerable. It is not a political cause, but a pseudo-religion meant to baptize liberals' ruthless pursuit of absolute power in the holy water of environmental virtue. At its very heart, environmental extremism is decidedly anti-human. Stewardship and conservation are supplanted by population control and economic regression. Environmental ideologues would ban the fuels that run almost all of the world's cars, planes, factories, farms, and electricity grids. Abandoning confidence in human resilience and creativity in responding to the challenges of the future would raise impediments to the most meaningful human activities. They would stand human affairs on their head, regarding human activity itself as fundamentally a threat to be sacrificed to the god of nature. The same goals are the heart of elite support for economic globalization. For 30 years, America's political, economic, and cultural leaders embraced an enriched communist China and its genocidal communist party while hollowing out America's industrial base. What may have started out with good intentions has now been made clear. Unfettered trade with China has been a catastrophe. It has made a handful of American corporations enormously profitable while twisting their business incentives away from the American people's needs. For a generation, politicians of both parties promised that engagement with Beijing would grow our economy while injecting American values into China. The opposite has happened. American factories have closed. Jobs have been outsourced. Our manufacturing economy has been financialized. And all along, the corporations profiting failed to export our values of human rights and freedom, rather, they imported China's anti-American values into their C-suites. Even before the rise of big tech, Wall Street ignored China's serial theft of American intellectual property. It outright cheered the elimination of American manufacturing jobs. Learn to code, they would gloat. These were just the price of progress. Engagement was at every step Beijing's project, not America's. The Chinese Communist Party, CCP, dictated terms, only to break them whenever it suited them. They stole our technology, spied on our people, and threatened our allies, all with trillions of dollars of wealth and military power financed by their access to our market. Then came the rise of big tech which is now less a contributor to the U.S. economy than it is a tool of China's government. In exchange for cheap labor and regulatory special treatment from Beijing, America's largest technology firms funnel data about Americans to the CCP. They hand over sensitive intellectual property with military and intelligence applications to keep the money rolling in. They let Beijing censor Chinese users on their platforms. They let the CCP set their corporate policies about mobile apps. And they run interference for our rivals' political priorities in Washington. One side of big tech companies' business model is old-fashioned American competitiveness and world-changing technological innovation, but increasingly, that side of these businesses is overshadowed by their role as operatives in the lucrative employ of America's most dangerous international enemy. If you want to understand the danger posed by collaboration between big tech and the CCP, look no further than TikTok. The highly addictive video app, used by 80 million Americans every month and overwhelmingly popular among teenage girls, is in effect a tool of Chinese espionage. The ties between TikTok and the Chinese government are not loose, and they are not coincidental. The same can be observed of many U.S. colleges and universities. Through the CCP's Confucius Institutes, Beijing has been just as successful at compromising and co-opting our higher education system as they have at compromising and co-opting. Corporate America A casual reader might take the last few pages as surveying a broad array of challenges facing the American people and the next conservative president, supranational. Policymaking, border security, globalization. Engagement with China, manufacturing, big tech, and Beijing compromised colleges. But these really are not many issues, but two, one, that China is a totalitarian enemy of the United States, not a strategic partner or fair competitor, and, two, that America's elites have betrayed the American people. The solution to all of the above problems is not to tinker with this or that government program, to replace this or that bureaucrat. These are problems not of technocratic efficiency but of national sovereignty and constitutional governance. We solve them not by trimming and reshaping the leaves but by ripping out the tree's root and branch. International organizations and agreements that erode our constitution, rule of law, or popular sovereignty should not be reformed, they should be abandoned. Illegal immigration should be ended, not mitigated, the border sealed, not reprioritized.
Economic engagement with China should be ended, not rethought. Our manufacturing and industrial base should be restored, not allowed to deteriorate. Further, Confucius Institutes, TikTok, and any other arm of Chinese propaganda and espionage should be outlawed, not merely monitored. Universities taking money from the CCP should lose their accreditation, charters, and eligibility for federal funds. The next conservative president should go beyond merely defending America's energy interests but go on offense, asserting them around the world. America's vast reserves of oil and natural gas are not an environmental problem, they are the lifeblood of economic growth. American dominance of the global energy market would be a good thing, for the world, and, more importantly, for we the people. It's not just about jobs, even though unleashing domestic energy production would create millions of them. It's not just about higher wages for workers who didn't go to college, though they would receive the raises they have missed out on for two generations. Full-spectrum strategic energy dominance would facilitate the reinvigoration of America's entire industrial and manufacturing sector as we disentangle our economy from China. Globally, it would rebalance power away from dangerous regimes in Russia and the Middle East. It would build powerful alliances with fast-growing nations in Africa and provide us the leverage to counter Chinese ambitions in South America and the Pacific. Locally, it would drive billions of dollars of private investment to the communities that have been hammered by globalization since the 1990s. And it would clarify our intentions to Beijing that the next president can ensure that a large part of America's reindustrialization is in the production of the equipment we will need to dissuade future foreign meddling with U.S. vital interests. Promise number four secure our God-given individual right to enjoy the blessings of liberty. The Declaration of Independence famously asserted the belief of America's founders that all men are created equal and endowed with God-given rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It's the last, the pursuit of happiness. That is central to America's heroic experiment in self-government. When the founders spoke of pursuit of happiness, what they meant might be understood today as in essence pursuit of blessedness. That is, an individual must be free to live as his creator ordained to flourish. Our constitution grants each of us the liberty to do not what we want, but what we ought. This pursuit of the good life is found primarily in family marriage, children, Thanksgiving dinners, and the like. Many find happiness through their work. Think of dedicated teachers or healthcare professionals you know, entrepreneurs or plumbers throwing themselves into their businesses anyone who sees a job well done is a personal reward. Religious devotion and spirituality are the greatest sources of happiness. Around the world. Still others find themselves happiest in their local voluntary communities of friends, their neighbors, their civic or charitable work. The American Republic was founded on principles prioritizing and maximizing individuals' rights to live their best life or to enjoy what the framers called the blessings of liberty. It's this radical equality liberty for all not just of rights but of authority that the rich and powerful have hated about democracy in America since 1776. They resent Americans' audacity in insisting that we don't need them to tell us how to live. It's this inalienable right of self-direction of each person's opportunity to direct himself or herself, and his or her community, to the good that the ruling class disdains. With the Declaration and Constitution, our nation's founders handed to us the means with which to preserve this right. Abraham Lincoln wrote of the Declaration as an apple of gold in a silver frame, the Constitution. So must the next conservative president look to these documents when the elites mount their next assault on liberty. Left to our own devices, the American people rejected European monarchy and colonialism just as we rejected slavery, second-class citizenship for women, mercantilism, socialism, Wilsonian globalism, fascism, communism, and, today, wokeism. To the left, these assertions of patriotic self-assurance are just so many signs of our moral depravity and intellectual inferiority proof that, in fact, we need a ruling elite making decisions for us. But the next conservative president should be proud, not ashamed of Americans' unique culture of social equality and ordered liberty. After all, the countries where Marxist elites have won political and economic power are all weaker, poorer, and less free for it. The United States remains the most innovative and upwardly mobile society in the world. Government should stop trying to substitute its own preferences for those of the people. And the next conservative president should champion the dynamic genius of free enterprise against the grim miseries of elite directed. Socialism. The promise of socialism communism, Marxism, progressivism, fascism, whatever name it chooses is simple, government control of the economy can ensure equal outcomes for all people. The problem is that it has never done so. There is no such thing as the government. There are just people who work for the government and wield its power and who at almost every opportunity wield it to serve themselves first and everyone else a distant second. This is not a failing of one nation or socialist party, but inherent in human nature. Nighttime satellite images of the Korean Peninsula famously show the free market. South lit up, with homes, businesses, and cities electrified from coast to coast. By contrast, communist North Korea is almost completely dark, except for the small dot of the capital city, Pyongyang, where a psychotic dictator and his cronies live.
the same phenomenon is on display in the infuriating fact that four of the six richest counties in the United States are suburbs of Washington, D.C. a city infamous for its lack of native productive industries. We see the same corruption expressed on an individual level whenever billionaire climate activists, who want to outlaw carbon fueled transportation, fly to A-list conferences on their private jets. Or when COVID-19 shut down politicians like former House Speaker Nancy Pelosi and California Governor Gavin Newsom were caught at the hair salon or dining at fancy restaurants after moralizing about how everyone else must stay home and forego such luxuries during the pandemic. For socialists, who are almost always well-to-do, socialism is not a means of equalizing outcomes, but a means of accumulating power. They never get around to helping anyone else. The Soviet Empire was a social and economic failure. North Korea, despite the opulence of its tyrants, is one of the poorest nations in the world. Cuba is so corrupt that its people regularly risk their lives to escape to Florida on rafts. Venezuela was once the richest nation in South America, today, a decade after a Marxist dictator took over, 94% of Venezuelans live in poverty. Point four. even socialist Senator Bernie Sanders' home state of Vermont was forced to repeal the state's single-payer health care system just three years after creating it. In every case, socialist elites promised that if only they could direct the economy, everything would be better. Very quickly, everything got worse. In socialist nation after socialist nation, the only way the government could keep its disgruntled people in line was to surveil and terrorize them. By contrast, in countries with a high degree of economic freedom, elites are not in charge because everyone is in charge. People work, build, invest, save, and create according to their own interests and in service to the common good of their fellow citizens. There is a reason why the private economy hews to the maxim the customer is always right while government bureaucracies are notoriously user-unfriendly, just as there is a reason why private charities are cheerful and government welfare systems are not. It's not because grocery store clerks and PDA moms are good and federal bureaucrats are bad. It's because private enterprises for profit or non-profit must cooperate, to give, to succeed. So as the American people take back their sovereignty, constitutional authority, respect for their families and communities, they should also take back their right to pursue the good life. The next president should promote pro-growth economic policies that spur new jobs and investment, higher wages, and productivity. Yes, that agenda should include overdue tax and regulatory reform, but it should go further and include antitrust enforcement against corporate monopolies. It should promote educational opportunities outside the woke-dominated system of public schools and universities, including trade schools, apprenticeship programs, and student loan alternatives that fund students' dreams instead of Marxist academics. Just as important as expanding opportunities for workers and small businesses, the next president should crack down on the crony capitalist corruption that enables America's largest corporations to profit through political influence rather than competitive enterprise and customer satisfaction. Analogous pro-growth reforms for America's voluntary civil society are also in order. America is not an economy, it is a country. Economic freedom is not the only important freedom. Freedom of religion, freedom of speech, and the freedom to assemble also represent key components of the American promise. Today, in addition to the problem of big tech censorship, we see speakers at universities shouted down, parents investigated and arrested for attempting to speak at school board meetings, and donors to conservative causes harassed and intimidated. The next conservative president must defend our First Amendment rights. Best effort. Ultimately, the left does not believe that all men are created equal they think they are special. They certainly don't think all people have an unalienable right to pursue the good life. They think only they themselves have such a right along with a moral responsibility to make decisions for everyone else. They don't think any citizen, state, business, church, or charity should be allowed any freedom until they first bend the knee. This book, this agenda, the entire Project 2025 is a plan to unite the conservative movement and the American people against elite rule and woke culture warriors. Our movement has not been united in recent years, and our country has paid the price. In the past decade, though, the breakdown of the family, the rise of China, the Great Awakening, big technicians' abuses, and the erosion of constitutional accountability in Washington have rendered these divisions not just inconvenient but politically suicidal. Every hour the left directs federal policy and elite institutions. Our sovereignty, our constitution, our families, and our freedom are a step closer to disappearing. Conservatives have just two years and one shot to get this right. With enemies at home and abroad, there is no margin for error. Time is running short. If we fail, the fight for the very idea of America may be lost. But we should take this small window of opportunity we have left to act with courage and confidence, not despair. The last time our nation and movement were so near defeat, we rallied together behind a great leader and great ideas, transcended our differences, rescued our nation, and changed the world. It's time to do it again. Now, as then, we know who we are fighting and what we are fighting for, for our republic, our freedom, and for each other. The next conservative president will enter office on January 20, 2025, with a simple choice greatness or failure.
It will be a daunting test, but no more so than every generation of Americans has faced and passed. The conservative promise represents the best effort of the conservative movement. In 2023 and the next conservative president's last opportunity to save our republic. End notes. 1. Ronald Reagan, Inaugural Address, January 5, 1967 https slash slash www.reaganlibrary.gov slash archive slash speech slash january 5 1967 inaugural address public ceremony accessed march 14 2023 2 quisp lopez six tech executives who raise their kids tech free or seriously limit their screen time business insider march 5 2020 https slash slash www.businessinsider.com slash tech execs screen time children bill gates steve jobs 2019-9 number google ceo sunder pitch as middle school aged son doesn't own a cell phone and the tv can only be accessed with activation energy one accessed march 14 2023 three simon hankinson woke public diplomacy undermines the state department's core mission and weakens u.s foreign policy heritage foundation backgrounder number 3738 december 12 2022 https slash slash www.heritage.org slash global politics slash report slash woke public diplomacy undermines the State Department's core mission and for Michelle Nichols, Venezuelans facing unprecedented challenges, many need aid internal UN report, https slash slash www.reuters.com slash article slash us Venezuela politics on slash Venezuelans facing unprecedented challenges many need aid internal UN report ID USKCN 1R92 AG, accessed March 14, 2023. Warning. Empty page. Section 1. Taking the reins. Of government. America's Bicentennial, which culminated on July 4, 1976, was a spirited and unifying celebration of our country, its founding, and its ideals. As we approach our nation's 250th anniversary, which will take place during the next presidency, America is now divided between two opposing forces, woke revolutionaries. And those who believe in the ideals of the American Revolution. The former believe that America is and always has been systemically racist and that it is not worth celebrating and must be fundamentally transformed, largely through a centralized administrative state. The latter believe in America's history and heroes, its principles and promise, and in everyday Americans and the American way of life. They believe in the Constitution and Republican government. Conservatives the Americanists. In this battle must fight for the soul of America, which is very much at stake. Just two years after the death of the last surviving Constitutional Convention delegate, James Madison, Abraham Lincoln warned that the greatest threat to America would come not from without, but from within. This is evident today, whether it be mask and vaccine mandates, school and business closures, efforts to keep Americans from driving gas cars or using gas stoves, or efforts to defund the police, indoctrinate school children, alter beloved books, abridge free speech, undermine the colorblind ideal, or deny the biological reality that there are only two sexes, the left's steady stream of insanity appears to be never-ending. The next administration must stand up for American ideals, American families, and American culture all things in which, thankfully, most Americans still believe. Highlighting this need, former director of the Office of Management and Budget Russ Vaught writes in Chapter 2, the modern conservative president's task is to limit, control, and direct the executive branch on behalf of the American people. At the core of this goal is the work of the White House and the central personnel agencies. Article 2 of the Constitution vests all federal executive power in a president made accountable to the citizenry through regular elections. Our founders wrote, the executive power shall be vested in a president of the United States of America. Accordingly, Vought writes, it is the president's agenda that should matter to the departments and agencies, not their own. Yet the federal bureaucracy has a mind of its own. Federal employees are often ideologically aligned not with the majority of the American people but with one another, posing a profound problem for Republican government, a government of, by, and for the people. As Donald Devine, Dennis Kirk, and Paul Dans write in Chapter 3, an autonomous bureaucracy has neither independent constitutional status nor separate moral legitimacy. Byzantine personnel rules provide the bureaucrats with their chief means of self-protection. What's more, knowledge of such rules is used to thwart the president's appointees and agenda. As Devine, Kirk, and Dan's write, managing the immense bureaucracy of the federal government is impossible without an understanding of the key central personnel agencies and their governing laws and regulations. Many of these laws and regulations governing a largely underworked, overcompensated, an unaccountable federal civilian workforce are so irrational that they would be comical in a less important context. This is true whether it comes to evaluating employees' performance or hiring new employees. Only in the federal government could an applicant in the hiring process be sent to the front of the line because of a history of drug addiction or alcoholism, or due to morbid obesity, irritable bowel syndrome, or a psychiatric disorder. The next administration should insist that the federal government's hiring, evaluation, retention, and compensation practices benefit taxpayers 
rather than benefiting the lowest rung of the federal workforce. In order to carry out the president's desires, political appointees must be given the tools, knowledge and support to overcome the federal government's obstructionist human resources departments. More fundamentally, the new administration must fill its ranks with political appointees. Devine, Kirk and Danz observe that the Trump administration appointed fewer political appointees in its first few months in office than any other recent presidency. This left career employees in charge in many places. This can occur even after departments have been fully staffed with political appointees. Vaught writes that the White House Office of Management and Budget, OMB, should establish a reputation as the keeper of commander's intent, yet OMB is dominated by career employees who often try to overrule political appointees serving in the various executive departments. Empowering political appointees across the administration is crucial to a president's success. Above all, the president and those who serve under him or her must be committed to the Constitution and the rule of law. This is particularly true of a conservative administration, which knows that the president is there to uphold the Constitution, not the other way around. If a conservative administration does not respect the Constitution, no administration will. In Chapter 1, former Deputy Chief of Staff to the President Rick Dearborn writes that the White House Counsel must take seriously the duty to protect the powers and privileges of the President from encroachments by Congress, the Judiciary and the administrative components of departments and agencies. Equally important, the President must enforce the Constitution and laws as written, rather than proclaiming new law unilaterally. Presidents should not issue mask or vaccine mandates, arbitrarily transfer student loan debt, or issue monarchical mandates of any sort. Legislatures make the laws in a republic, not executives. It is crucial that all three branches of the federal government respect what Madison called the double security to our liberties, the separation of powers among the three branches, and the separation of powers between the federal government and the states. This double security has been greatly compromised over the years. Vaught writes that the modern executive branch, writes federal policy, enforces that policy, and often adjudicates whether that policy was properly drafted and enforced. He describes this as constitutionally dire and in urgent need of repair, adding, nothing less than the survival of self-governance in America is at stake. When it comes to ensuring that freedom can flourish, nothing is more important than deconstructing the centralized administrative state. Political appointees who are answerable to the president and have decision-making authority in the executive branch are key to this essential task. The next administration must not cede such authority to nonpartisan experts, who pursue their own ends while engaging in groupthink, insulated from American voters. The following chapters detail how the next administration can be responsive to the American people, not to entrench elites, how it can take care that all the laws are faithfully executed. Not merely those that the president desires to see executed, and how it can achieve results and not be stymied by an unelected bureaucracy. Warning, Empty Page 1. White House Office Rick Dearborn From popular culture to academia, the American presidency has long been a prominent fixture of the national imagination naturally so since it is the beating heart of our nation's power and prestige. It has played, for instance, a feature role in innumerable movies and television shows and has been prodded, analyzed and critiqued by countless books, essays, and studies. But like nearly everything else in life, there is no substitute for first-hand experience, which this manual has compiled from the experience of presidential appointees and provides an accessible form for future use. With respect to the presidency, it is best to begin with our republic's foundational document. The Constitution gives the executive power to the president when it designates him as commander-in-chief too and gives him the responsibility to take care that the laws be faithfully executed. 3. It further prescribes that the president might seek the assistance of the principal officer in each of the executive departments. 4. Beginning with George Washington, every president has been supported by some form of White House office consisting of direct staff officers as well as a cabinet comprised of department and agency heads. Since the inaugural administration of the late 18th century, citizens have chosen to devote both their time and their talent to defending and strengthening our nation by serving at the pleasure of the president. Their shared patriotic endeavor has proven to be a noble one, not least because the jobs in what is now known as the White House office, who, are among the most demanding in all of government. The president must rely on the men and women appointed to the WHO. There simply are not enough hours in the day to manage the affairs of state single-handedly. So delegation is not just advisable, it is essential. The decisions that assistants and senior advisors make will directly impact the administration, its legacy, and most important the fate of the country. Their agenda must therefore be the president's agenda. Choosing who will carry out that agenda on a daily basis is not only one of the first decisions a president makes in office, but also one of the most critical. The tone and tempo of an administration are often determined on January 20th. Chief of Staff As with most of the positions that will be covered in this first chapter, the chief of staff is also an assistant to the president. However, the chief is truly first among equals. Of all presidential staff members, the chief is the most critical to implementation of the president's vision for the country.
The chief also has a dual role as manager of the staffs of both the WHO and the Executive Office of the President, EOP.5. The chief of staff's first managerial task is to establish an organizational chart for the WHO. It should be simple and contain clear lines of authority and responsibility. To avoid conflicts. It should also identify specific points of contact for each element of the government outside of the White House. These contacts should include the White House liaisons who are selected by the Office of Presidential Personnel, PPO. Receiving guidance from the President, the Chief endeavors to implement the President's agenda by setting priorities for the WHO. This process begins by taking stock of the President's campaign promises, identifying current and prospective opportunities, and then delegating policy priorities among the departments and agencies of the Cabinet and throughout the three White House policy councils. L. The National Economic Council, NEC. L. The Domestic Policy Council, DPC, and L. The National Security Council, NSC. The President is briefed on all of his policy priorities by his Cabinet and senior staff as directed by the Chief. The Chief along with senior WHO staff maps out the issues and themes that will be covered daily and weekly. The Chief then works with the Policy Councils, the Cabinet and the Office of Communications and Office of Legislative Affairs, OLA, to sequence and execute the rollout of policies and announcements. White House Counsel and Senior Advisors and Senior Counselors are also intimately involved. All senior staff report to the Chief of Staff, either directly or through his two or three deputies, unless the President determines that a particular assistant to the President reports directly to him. Most Chiefs have interacted directly with Cabinet officers in a select number of direct reports. In most cases, the direct reports to the Chief are his two or three deputies, the Communications Director, PPO Director, White House Counsel, and Senior Advisors. Occasionally, the Office of Public Liaison, OPL, the Cabinet Secretary, and Intergovernmental Affairs, IGA, also report directly to the Chief. Usually, however, they report instead to a Deputy Chief of Staff. The Chief of Staff's main challenge is time management. His use of his deputies, meetings with senior staff, and direction provided to the WHO must all balance with the daily needs of the President. A successful Chief steers the West Wing using his management of an influence with the various individuals and entities around him. It goes without saying that selecting the right person to be chief is vital. Deputy Chiefs of Staff In recent years, presidents typically have appointed two deputy chiefs of staff, a deputy chief of staff for management and operations and a deputy chief of staff for policy. There also have been other types of deputy chiefs whose roles have included, for example, overseeing strategy, planning, and implementation. Chiefs of staff have then occasionally appointed a principal deputy chief to be in charge of guiding decision-making, organizational structure, and information flow. Principal Deputy Chiefs of Staff Not all Chiefs of Staff have tapped a Principal Deputy. A major reason is that doing so adds another layer of command complexity. When Principal Deputies have been installed, their roles have varied based on the needs of particular Chiefs. Most Principal Deputies have functioned as doorkeepers, sorting through action items, taking on those that can be handled at their own level, and passing up others that truly require the attention of the Chief of Staff or the President. Principal Deputies also have assumed control of the scheduling functions, normally under the Operations Deputy and have worked directly with the policy councils at the direction of the Chief of Staff. The OPL and Office of Political Affairs, OPA, also have reported to a Principal Deputy. Deputy Chief of Staff for Management and Operations The Deputy Chief of Staff for Management and Operations oversees the President's schedule and all logistical aspects of his movement within and outside of the White House, for example, both air travel on Air Force One and Marine One and ground transportation. This deputy also interfaces directly with the Secret Service as well as the military offices tasked with keeping the President and his family safe. In the past, this deputy has also worked with the NSC, the Secretary of Defense, the Secretary of State, and the intelligence community and on advancing all foreign trips. If their roles are separated from that of the policy deputy, this deputy should have a strong grasp of international affairs and robust foreign policy credentials. This deputy further manages all facets of the working White House, technology, grounds management, support staff, personnel administration, and communications. This individual therefore needs to be meticulous and ideally should possess a great deal of command and control experience. Deputy Chief of Staff for Policy In some administrations, the functions of the IGA, OPA, and OPL and other advisors within the WHO have fallen under the Deputy Chief of Staff for Policy. For conservatives, this arrangement could help to connect the WHO's outreach to political and external groups and be a strong conduit for state and local elected officials, state party organizations, and both grass stop and grassroots groups. This deputy chief works directly with the chief of staff, cabinet officers, and all three policy councils to support the development and implementation of the president's agenda. This deputy chief should therefore have impressive policy credentials. In the realms of economic, domestic, and social affairs. Senior advisors. Presidents have surrounded themselves with senior advisors whose experience and interests are not necessarily neatly defined. In recent administrations, 
senior advisors have been appointed to offer broad guidance on political matters and communications issues, others have acted as czars for specific projects or policy areas. The most powerful senior advisors frequently have had a long personal relationship with the president and often have spent a significant amount of time with him within and outside of the White House. They have been asked not only to provide guidance on a variety of policy issues, but also to offer instruction on communicating with the American people and the media. In a number of administrations, new offices or councils have been created to support senior advisors. For the most part, their functions have been duplicative or overlapping, as a result of which these offices have tended to be short-lived. Even so, senior advisors should be provided the staff and resources that their portfolios require. To ensure that senior advisors are effective, their portfolios must be clearly delineated and clearly communicated across the White House. This too is a responsibility of the Chief of Staff. Office of White House Counsel The Office of White House Counsel provides legal guidance to the President and elements of the EOP on a host of issues, including presidential powers and privileges, ethics compliance, review of clemency applications, and judicial nominations. The selection of White House Counsel is one of the most important decisions an incoming President will make. The office is not designed to create or advance policies on its own initiative nor should it do so. Rather, it is dedicated to guiding the President and his reports on how, within the bounds of the law, to pursue and realize the President's agenda. While the White House Counsel does not serve as the President's personal attorney, in non-official matters, it is almost impossible to delineate exactly where an issue is strictly personal and has no bearing on the President's official function. The White House Counsel needs to be deeply committed both to the President's agenda and to affording the President proactive counsel and zealous representation. That individual directly advises the President as he performs the duties of the office, and this requires a relationship that is built on trust, confidentiality, and candor. The Office of White House Counsel is also responsible for ensuring that each component of the White House adheres to all applicable legal and ethical guidelines, which often requires ongoing training and monitoring to ensure compliance. This means ensuring that White House staff regularly consult with office attorneys on required financial disclosures, received gifts, potential conflicts of interest, and other ethical concerns. The Office of White House Counsel is the first line of defense for the EOP. Its staff must take seriously the duty to protect the powers and privileges of the President from encroachments by Congress, the Judiciary, and the administrative components of departments and agencies. In addition to the White House Counsel, the office includes deputies, assistants, associates, and legal support staff. The assistant and associate attorneys are often specialists in particular areas of the law and offer guidance to the EOP on issues related to national security, criminal law, environmental law, and a host of administrative and regulatory matters. Attorneys working in the Office of White House Counsel serve as legal advisors to the White House policy operation by reviewing executive orders, agency regulations, and other policy-related functions. Here again, subordinates should be deeply committed to the President's agenda and see their role as helping to accomplish the agenda through problem-solving and advocacy. They should not erect roadblocks out of an abundance of caution, rather, they should offer practical legal advice on how to promote the President's agenda within the bounds of the law. The White House Counsel's Office cannot serve as a finishing school to credential the next set of white shoe law firm attorneys or federal judges in waiting who cabin their opinions for fear their elite credentials could be tarnished through a policy disagreement. Rather, it should function more as an activist yet ethical plaintiff's firm that advocates for its client the administration's agenda within the limits imposed by the Constitution and the duties of the legal profession. The Office of White House Counsel also serves as the primary gateway for communication between the White House and the Department of Justice, DOJ. Traditionally, both the White House Counsel and the Attorney General have issued a memo requiring all contact between the two institutions to occur only between the Office of White House Counsel and the Attorney General or Deputy Attorney General. The next administration should re-examine this policy and determine whether it might be more efficient or more appropriate for communication to occur through additional channels. The White House Counsel also works closely with the DOJ Office of Legal Counsel to seek opinions on, for example, matters of policy development and the constitutionality of presidential power and privileges and with OLA and the DOJ Office of Legal Policy on presidential judicial nominees. When a new president takes office, he will need to decide expeditiously how to handle any major ongoing litigation or other pending legal matters that might present a challenge to his agenda. To offer guidance, the White House Counsel must get up to speed as quickly as possible on all significant ongoing legal challenges across the executive branch that might affect the new administration's policy agenda and must be prepared at the outset of the administration to present recommendations to the President, including recommendations for reconsidering or reversing positions of the previous administration in any significant litigation. This review will usually require consulting with the new political leadership at the Justice Department, including during the transition period. No day is predictable at the White House. Therefore, to handle the pace and volatility of affairs, the Office of White House Counsel must offer measured legal guidance in a timely manner. This often means foregoing law review-style memos about esoteric legal concepts and instead quickly providing high-level yet incisive guidance. 
Due to evolving world events, domestic affairs, and political pressures, the office often faces legal questions for which there may not be a wealth of precedent. Attorneys in the office of White House Counsel must therefore work collaboratively within the White House and the Department of Justice, relying on each other as a team, to ensure that proper legal guidance is delivered to the President. The President should choose a White House Counsel who is well-versed in the Constitution, administrative and regulatory law, and the inner workings of Congress and the political process. Instead of choosing a specialist, the President should hire a counsel with extensive experience with a wide range of complex legal subjects. Moreover, while a candidate with elite credentials might seem ideal, the best one will be above all loyal to the President and the Constitution. Staff Secretary The office of the Staff Secretary is rarely visible to the outside world, but it performs work of tremendous importance. The office is similar to a military commander's. Adjutant as it is responsible for fielding and managing a vast amount of information at the top of its organization. This includes information on its way into the Oval Office as well as information flowing out from the Oval Office. Because of its gatekeeping function, the position of Staff Secretary is one of extreme trust, and the individual who possesses it should be vetted to work as an honest broker in the President's service. The office of the Staff Secretary has been described as the last substantive control point before papers reach the Oval Office. A great deal of information is headed toward the Oval Office at any moment. This includes presidential decision memos, bills passed by Congress, which may be accompanied by signing or veto statements, and briefing books, reading materials, samples of constituent mail, personal mail, and drafts of speeches. The staff secretary makes certain that these materials are complete, well-ordered, and up-to-date before they reach the president. This necessarily means that the staff secretary plays a key role in determining who weighs in on policy matters and when. As noted above, the staff secretary also handles information leaving the Oval Office. The president may have questions after reviewing incoming material, may wish to seek more information, or may demand revisions. The staff secretary is often responsible for directing these requests to the appropriate places and following up on them to ensure that they are completed. One of the staff secretary's critical functions is managing and overseeing the clearance process for the president's daily-slash-nightly briefing book. This book is filled with all the reading material and leading documentation the president needs in the morning and the evening to help him make decisions. The staff secretary also oversees the use of the president's signature, whether by hand or by autopen, and manages the office of the executive clerk. Office of Records Management, and Office of Presidential Correspondence. Office of Communications. The Office of Communications, which operates under the Director of Communications, conveys the President's agenda to the public through various media, including speeches and remarks, press briefings, off the record discussions with reporters, and social media. Depending on how a President chooses to structure his White House, the Office of Communications may include the Office of the Press Secretary, Press Office, but no matter how it is structured, the office must work closely with the press office as well as the president's speechwriters and digital strategists. Operational functions of the Office of Communications include scheduling and running press briefings, interviews, meetings, media appearances, speeches, and a range of other events. The Office of Communications must maintain robust relationships with the White House Press Corps, the White House Correspondents Association, regional stakeholders, and key interest groups. No legal entitlement exists for the provision of permanent space for media on the White House campus and the next administration should re-examine the balance between media demands and space constraints on the White House premises. Leadership within the Office of Communications should include a communications director, who is a direct report to the chief of staff, a deputy communications director, a deputy director for strategic communications, and a press secretary. This leadership team must work together closely to drive the national narrative about the White House. The best resource for the Office of Communications is the president. The president conveys the White House's overall message through one or two inaugural addresses, State of the Union addresses, speeches to Congress, and press conferences. The office must also ensure that the various White House offices disseminate a unified message to the public. The communications director and press secretary in particular should be careful to avoid contradicting the president or delivering conflicting information. The speechwriting team is a critical component of the communications team. Speechwriting is a unique talent, the writers selected must understand policy, should have a firm grasp of history and other liberal arts disciplines, and should be able to learn and adopt the president's style of rhetoric and mode of delivery. The press secretary is the president's spokesperson, communicating to the American people through the media. The press secretary engages with the White House press corps formally through press briefings and informally through impromptu gaggles and meetings. Individuals who serve in this role must be quick on their feet, which means, when appropriate, deftly refuting and rebutting correspondence. Questions and Comments the communications director must convey the president's mission to the American people. Especially for conservatives, this means navigating the mainstream media to ensure that the president's agenda is conveyed effectively and accurately. The communications director must be politically savvy and very aware of the ongoing activities of the other White House offices. 
the new administration should examine the nature of the relationship between itself and the White House Correspondents Association and consider whether an alternative coordinating body might be more suitable. Office of Legislative Affairs, OLA Created by President Dwight Eisenhower, the OLA has continued to serve as the liaison between the White House and Congress. The White House must work with congressional leaders to ensure presidential nominees, for roles such as cabinet secretaries and ambassadors, are confirmed by the Senate. The White House also relies on Congress to enact reforms promised by the President on the campaign trail, whether those promises relate to health care, education, or national defense. Because Congress holds the power of the purse, White House staffers must ensure that there is enough support on the Hill to secure the necessary funding through the appropriations process to fulfill the President's agenda. The OLA reports directly to the Chief of Staff and in some administrations has done so under the guidance of a Deputy Chief of Staff, usually the Deputy Chief. For policy. Regardless of the person to whom the OLA reports, however, the office exercises a certain autonomy on behalf of the President and the Chief of Staff in directly influencing congressional leaders of both major political parties. The OLA often must function as the mediator among the parties and find common ground to facilitate the successful enactment of the President's agenda. As is the case with many White House offices, but especially the Office of Communications. The OLA must ensure that congressional leaders receive one unified message. If other actors within the White House maintain their own relationships with congressional leaders and staffers, it may appear that the president's agenda is fractured and lacks consensus. This dynamic has caused real problems for many presidents in the past. Internally, OLA staffers need to be involved in policy discussions, budget reviews, and other important meetings. They must also provide advice to policy staffers regarding whether certain ideas are politically feasible. Externally, OLA staffers have to communicate continuously with congressional offices of both parties in both the House and the Senate to ensure that the President has enough support to enact his legislative priorities or sustain votes. The OLA requires staffers who are effective communicators and can provide a dose of reality to other White House staffers when necessary. Although a policy proposal from within the White House may be a great idea, OLA staffers must ensure that it is politically feasible. OLA staffers must therefore be skilled in both politics and policy. Furthermore, the President should seek out individuals who can advance his agenda and at the same time forge pathways with members of the opposing political party on other priorities. Most important, the OLA must function as a well-oiled machine, precisely synced. The President cannot afford to have a tennis player on much less as the leader of his football team. Office of Presidential Personnel, PPO The political axiom that personnel is policy was popularized under President Ronald Reagan during the 1981 presidential transition. One of the most important offices in the White House is the PPO which was created under President Richard Nixon to centralize political appointments. Departments and agencies had and still have direct legal authority on hiring and firing, but the power to fill Schedule C positions. The core of political jobs is vested with the President. Therefore, the White House, not the department or agency, has the final word on political appointments. PPO's primary responsibility is to staff the executive branch with individuals who are equipped to implement the President's agenda. Although its focus should be identifying and recruiting leaders to fill the approximately 1,000 appointments that require Senate confirmation, PPO must also fill approximately 3,000 political jobs that require dedicated conservatives to support the administration's political leadership. Frequently, many medium-tier and top-tier jobs have been filled by policy experts tasked with accomplishing much of the work of the administration. At the same time, appointees in the entry-level jobs have brought invaluable energy and commitment to the White House and have proved to be the farm team for the conservative movement. The Office of Presidential Personnel is responsible for L. Identifying potential political personnel both actively through recruitment and passively by fielding resumes and adjudicating requests from political actors. L. Vetting potential political personnel by conducting political background checks and reviewing any clearance and fitness assessments by departments and agencies. L. Making recommendations to the President and to other appointment authorities on behalf of the President. L. Identifying programmatic political workforce needs early and developing plans, for example, Schedule F. L. Maintaining a strong relationship with the Office of Personnel Management, OPM, both for operational purposes and to effectuate the President's direct Title V authorities. The President is in charge of the federal workforce and exercises control principally by working through the Director of the Office of Personnel Management. L. Training and connecting political personnel. L. Playing bad cop in a way that other White House offices cannot, including serving as the office that takes direct responsibility for firings and hirings. L. Serving as a personnel link between conservative organizations and the executive branch. In most administrations, PPO will staff more than 100 positions during a transition and thousands of non-carrier positions during the president's first term. Direct authority and a strong relationship with the president are necessary attributes for any PPO director. Historically, PPO has had direct review and control of personnel files, including security clearance dossiers. At the highest level, PPO is tasked with long-term, strategic workforce development. 
the billets of political appointments are of immense importance in credentialing and training future leaders. In addition, whatever one's view of the constitutionality of various civil service rules, for example, the Federal Vacancies Reform Act of 19,986, might be, it is necessary to ensure that departments and agencies have robust cadres of political staff just below senior levels in the event of unexpected vacancies. Office of Political Affairs, OPA The OPA is the primary office within the executive branch for managing the president's political interests. Although its specific functions vary from administration to administration, the OPA typically serves as the liaison between the president and associated political entities, national committees, federal and state campaigns, and interest groups. Within legal guidelines, the OPA engages in outreach, conducts casework, and if the president is up for re-election assists with his campaign. The OPA may also monitor congressional campaigns, arrange presidential visits with other political campaigns, and recommend campaign staff to the Office of Presidential Personnel for service in the executive branch. The OPA further serves as a line of communication between the White House and the president's political party. This includes both relaying the president's ambitions to political interests and listening to the needs of political interests. This relationship allows for the exchange of information between the White House and political actors across the country. The OPA should have one director of political affairs who reports either to the chief of staff or to a deputy chief of staff. The OPA should also include various deputy directors, each of whom is responsible for a certain geographical region of the country. Because nearly all White House activities are in some way inherently political, the OPA needs to be aware of all presidential actions and activities including travel, policy decisions, speeches, nominations, and re